Welcome to the Strategic Project Leader, where we help you leverage strategic project management so you can achieve your goals. Now, here's your host, Paula Allaby. Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to the Strategic Project Leader. On Strategic Project Leader podcast, we share strategies and tools to help you as a professional and executive leader elevate in your career, your business, and even in your personal life, leverage strategic project management and skills. It's always fun to be right there with you on a Saturday like this to share tools and strategies as well. I'm your host, Fola F. Alibi, an author, a speaker, and a coach. I'm all about helping you elevate, and this platform is where you can learn and even unlearn the things that you've known from the past that hasn't really helped you so well so you can actually elevate and become a better leader. Today is a different one because I am streaming from somewhere special, but save that. I'm going to leave you to guess, and there's going to be something up before the end of the show where I'm actually streaming live today from. But I've got a great leader today who's going to be joining me. He's going to be talking about something he's extremely passionate about. We have been waiting for this show for such a long time. He's an internationally recognized expert and speaker. He's an author when it comes to enterprise and corporate performance management and improvement. He's one that he's founded the analytics-based performance management. He's an advisory firm located in North Carolina as well. He's got a a degree in industrial engineering and he's done a lot of research work. He did one from the Cornell University in 1971. I don't know if I was actually here then, but the fact is that he's been here for a very long time. He's been delivering value and it gives me so much joy to bring right on, you know, on stage with me, Gary Kids. Gary, how are you doing today? I'm always good. <laughs> Fantastic. And let us know in the comments where you're actually joining us from, because I'm going to be spilling the tea pretty soon. Thank you so much. Um, I just have to adjust a little bit because this is not my, my base location. And so another piece I want to apologize ahead of time in case we have some glitches, in case something's happened. Just bear with us. We are here to give you the best and to talk about pretty much cost management and how we can help and leverage that to improve corporate performance as well as helping drive strategic goals and objectives. So first of all, without any further ado, Gary, first of all, where are you joining us from today? Well, I always like to start that I'm a native of Chicago, go Cubs, go Bears for anybody that's in the United States, but I live in Raleigh, North Carolina. Fantastic, North Carolina, we're actually rooting for you today. Obviously, I'm always in Canada, but today I want someone to guess. We've got Martha from Ethiopia. We've got Mohammed from Riyadh. We've got um, someone from Chicago. Thank you so much for being here. We've got someone from Nairobi. We want to say thank you from all over the world. We're joining. We're going to be diving deep into cost management. There are different layers to this, but I want someone to guess where I'm actually streaming from. If you if you're regular on the show, you know that this is obviously not my fancy um, background. I had someone really special who had to help me set this up to make sure that this happened today. I'm going to release that just before the end of the show. So, Gary, what is cost management? Well, let me first share a little bit more about myself, and then I'll get into enterprise and corporate performance. You mentioned, yes, I did get my bachelor's degree in industrial engineering and operations research from Cornell in 1971. I got my MBA from Northwestern University Kellogg School of Management at 74. If anyone's doing the math, I am 74 years old, but I feel like I'm 44 oh, years old. I know. You're 74 <laughs> years strong because you don't even look it at all. Goodness. Uh, you need to yeah. bottle whatever that is that you are actually like what you're brewing because it definitely is working. So well, let's get into it. Part, part of it may be because I'm actually Greek American and then people who know the Italians and the Greeks, the Mediterranean, we are passionate. So um, in terms of my career, my first decade was in industry, large manufacturing conglomerate, and then seven years with Deloitte Consulting, five years with KPMG Consulting, uh, five years with electronic data systems, which is part of Hewlett Packard. And then I was 16 years with a very large analytic software vendor called SAS, SAS, 15,000 employees here in, in Raleigh. So that's enough on my background. Um, to answer your question, let's broaden cost management is a subset 
of enterprise and corporate performance management. And corporate enterprise and corporate performance management is not a process or a system. It's actually the integration of multiple methods. Think of them like gears in a machine. And when they're seamlessly integrated like those gears, you then get the improvement methods that your show is, uh, is all about. Um, can I take a couple of minutes and just describe why in the last five or 10 years there's been interest in these corporate and performance management methods? Yeah, yeah, definitely, for sure, because I think it's, it's very, very important that we get into perspective as to organizations are out there for a reason. They want to be able to add value to their clients. They want to be able to make money while delivering something that's actually valuable. And there are different, different parameters that have to be in place to ensure that success can actually be achieved. And when we think about that, corporate performance management is one that organizations have to you know, pay close attention to, to ensure that they are on track to do that. So over to you, Gary, give us some, throw some more light to that. Yeah, and, and incidentally, I like to use the term enterprise and corporate because these methods actually apply to public sector government and nonprofit. So it's not just restricted to commercial organizations, but that's the majority you know, who, who do use it. Um, the first cause of interest is what I call strategy, executive frustration with strategy failure. You know, they're quite good at formulating the strategy of their organization, but their frustration is being unsuccessful at having the managers and employees implement it. And this is where the world of the Kaplan and Norton, people may have heard of Professor Robert as Kaplan, Harvard Business School, the strategy map, the balanced scorecard with KPIs. A second force is just increased accountability. You know, today, there is no place to hide. Managers and employees will be monitored. They will be measured. It doesn't necessarily mean their jobs are at risk, but it could adversely impact their salary increases and job promotions. The next force is more rapid decision making. Unlike a few years ago when you could test and learn and have meetings and conference rooms, you know, today people are on the phone, go or no go, yes or no. They need to make uh, decisions in near real time. The next force, the fourth one, is mistrust of the management accounting system. Most managers do not trust the management accounting information from the CFO and the accountants. I'm not talking about the external statutory financial reporting for government regulators. I'm talking about internal management accounting, which you can actually make different assumptions. We'll talk about that in a minute. The fifth one is what I call poor customer value management. You know, customers are the source of financial wealth creation for owners and shareholders. The problem is, again, the accountants and the CFOs, they don't report that information. They stop, if you're familiar with an income statement, they stop halfway down at the gross product or service line profit margin. They don't include channel distribution expenses, marketing expenses, selling expenses, cost to serve, creating a profit and loss statement for each customer. The next one is budgeting. You know, this may surprise the audience. I think the annual budgeting process is broken. The problems are it's out of date a couple of months after it's published. It caves into the loudest voice and strongest muscle, especially like gray hairs and know how to pad the budget. Um, and there's a way to basically improve the methodology to get a much better projection of what the expenses are that will be needed, the capacity, this is the industrial engineer in me, and not just doing a annual budget, but basically going into rolling financial forecast, refreshing it periodically. The next may not apply to many of the people listening, but supply chain management is dysfunctional. The problem is most customers view their suppliers as the enemy. It's an adversarial relationship. They try to pound on their suppliers to lower their prices. If they put the price out of the supplier out of business, so what? We can always get another supplier. That's got to stop. It needs to be a marriage. Supply chains are competing against other supply chains for share of wallet and purse. They need to collaborate to find mutually beneficial projects. And then the last one is unfulfilled return on investment promises from large IT systems like enterprise resource planning systems, ERP systems. And the problem there is the ERP systems are good at producing transactional data, but not information. And so if you ask the chief information officer, or the IT director, how well do you believe the return on investment from implementing your ERP system has met or exceeded what the software salesman sold you on three years ago, many of them will be hard pressed to say yes. 
you know, that does not mean you don't implement ERP. You have to because your competitors in your industry also have it. To get a competitive edge, though, you've got to convert that data into information. And that's what the corporate performance management methods do. So I can dive deeper into a few, three or four of those. But I do want to yeah. mention that at some point, I'm then going to talk about where does project management fit into all this? Because I understand, you know, your show is for project leaders, but, you know, projects, methods, they're so synonymous. So the project management, project implementation is critical. So what would you like to cover next, Fola? So when we think about that, for everyone who's actually listening, we have just unpacked different variables that pretty much affect what an organization can actually um, become because there's so many factors. However, when we think about it, we're going to be zoning into the numbers very soon because today we want to talk about that cost management. However, I want people to know that you're going to have an opportunity for us to go through your questions. So stop putting your questions in the comments so we can pull that up because towards the end of the show, we're going to review that and you're going to get a chance to get your questions answered directly by Gary. So start putting that in so we can get into it. So when we think about um, the whole enterprise system, we, we realize that organizations have got different factors. What would you rank when you see those six, the eight areas, what would, what's like, what ranks at the very top for you? Okay. Well, actually, before I do that, if there is not enough time for all the answers, people can more than welcome to email me. You'll need to write this down. It's G Koken, C O K I N S, at GaryKokens.com. And the GaryKokens.com is also my website. And in the tabs below it are free articles that you can download, no charge uh, to learn more. And you're more than welcome to invite me in LinkedIn. Now, to your question of like those eight factors, you know, being a consultant, I've learned there's always one answer to every question. It depends, you know, so it, de it depends on the needs of the organization. But if I had to prioritize, I think I'd start with the first one, strategy management, the world of the Kaplan and Norton strategy map and balance scorecard. And just I'm going to be a little bit of a professor here and give some background. The reason Kaplan and Norton created this balance scorecard with strategy map were a couple of reasons. One, the senior executives were overreacting to financial results reported at the end of the fiscal period. They said, you need to shift your attention to non-financial metrics measured during the period. And they created, and you can Google strategy map balance scorecard, you can see what I'm about to describe. They created these four perspectives that have cause and effect relationships. And each of the perspectives have strategic objectives. So the first one, the lower one is uh, innovation and growth. That's the soft one where employees, you know, grow. If they're accomplishing those objectives, they'll contribute to the process improvement objectives. If they're accomplishing those, they'll contribute up to the third perspective, customer loyalty, retention. And then that will eventually surface to the top to the financial objectives. But the other reason they created it was most employees don't understand the executive team strategy. I mean, for example, if I walked into any organization of your people listening to me and in the hallways, I randomly interviewed 10 employees and said, quick, two minutes, can you explain your executive team strategy to me? How many of them could do it? Probably none. Well, if the employees and managers don't understand the employee, the executive strategy, how do we expect them to understand what they do each day, each week contributes to the strategy? So that's the strategy management one. Yeah, I know. I want us to unpack that pretty quickly because a lot of the time on the podcast, we always talk to project leaders and we make you understand that every project that gets initiated has to tie back to a strategic objective and a strategic goal. And so if you don't even understand what those things are, you may even do, we, we actually did even a project that actually practically adds no value or maybe very little value. And it could be you know, possible that something else should definitely be taking the place of your project. So from the start, when you go off today, you need to think about it. You need to understand why exactly are we in business and what are the drivers behind that? Why exactly do we decide, for instance, to prioritize maybe five key projects over the other? That is, those are the key things that, first of all, sets you apart from other project managers and other professionals. Even if you're a coordinator, even if you're one who is just starting off a career, even if you're a floor sweeper, interestingly, you need to know, why am I doing this? What well, value is he added? So I want us to unpack that, Gary. When we think about the strategy of an organization, 
how the comments get into that? Because I know you've had you've done it for decades, and people want to understand. So how do I even get around to get you know get into this? Well, I have a technique. Uh, it's called rapid prototyping with iterations. I, I'm a I'm a Pareto law eighty twenty. You know, sense of urgency. And so I have a technique, and people can communicate with me later, where I can help a small team of executives in a room in one day build a strategy map uh, very quickly. I do it with yellow post-its and SWOT analysis and, and the like. But what's critical is after they have their strategy map, that they then, a couple things, they delegate the map to their employees and managers and say, you identify the strategic objectives, and you identify what the key performance indicators are. So why do we want this delegation to occur? One, we want their buy-in. We want, we want them to understand that it's the select the KPIs that they're going to be measured by. And incidentally, and once we get to KPIs, the executives will now put targets on the KPIs. This is where the accountability that I mentioned fits in. So the target is like a, you know, a mule with the carrot, you know, and when all of the managers and the employee teams are now trying to meet or exceed the targets, guess what the result is? They're aligning the strategy, they're aligning with the strategy of the executives. And I may add something about strategy failure. In the United States, there's a executive recruiting firm that monitors the involuntary turnover of CEOs, the firing of CEOs. It's been increasing every year. And I believe the reason why is board of directors post Enron, people remember the Enron disaster, they, take, right. their they take their governance job far more responsibly. So if the CEO is not implementing the strategy, they're fired. The good example would be Carly Fiorini with Hewlett Packard. Some may remember, you know, they made her the CEO. She couldn't implement the strategy successfully. You know, they fired her. So that's kind of where the accountability fits in. I really love that. So think about the fact that as project professionals, you are helping ensure that the CEO is actually successful. <laughs> yeah, not fired. <laughs> exactly. And so your role fits in directly to creating something even bigger and better. And when we think about China Path to C-Suite, we are teaching how you can actually become that leader who drives that. So let's get into the next one. You've actually ranked strategy management as the number one. What follows suit with that, Gary? What will be the next thing that's important? Management accounting. You know, I mentioned earlier a couple of things that managers do not trust the management accounting information. And the reason why, and I think many people listening are going to relate to what I'm about to say, it's overhead cost allocations. The way the accountants do it, and they're pretty lazy, is they take this indirect expense, which is the proper term, um, uh, and they allocate it to the product cost or the service line cost, like spreading butter across bread. They use these cost allocation factors like number of labor hours or number of units produced or sales amount or headcount per cost center. None of those factors reflect the unique consumption that the various products or service lines consume of the end-to-end -end processes and the activity expenses that belong to them. So the solution is a method called activity-based costing. Now, activity-based costing, sadly, has a bad reputation from the past because people implemented it far too large, far too complex, um, and it was unsustainable. No one could understand it. And then I am an advocate of you doing a simpler high-level model uh, system. But here's the result. When you trace and assign each of these various, what are called cost pools in the overhead to the products and services, mm -hmm. you will discover compared to that butter spreading, in reality, some of the products and services were overcosted. The others must be undercosted because it's a zero sum error game. And the mm -hmm. magnitude of the error compared to that traditional butter spreading can be 20, 30% really large and so what that means is that the CFO and the accountants are providing the managers flawed and misleading information, and they're using that information to make decisions, which can be poor decisions because they don't have the accuracy of, of what it takes. So 
that's why management accounting shows up number two. If I could go on, the, the next one that's related is customer costing, customer profitability. I mentioned that customers are the source of value wealth creation for shareholders and owners. So if the CFO and the accountants not only implement their activity-based costing for the products and service lines, but then go below that to include channel distribution, marketing, selling, cost to serve, now the marketing and salespeople have better information to answer questions like, which type of customer is more attractive to retain, to grow, to win yeah. back and acquire, which types are not? And just if I could amplify, you would think, many people think, well, the sales amount is equivalent to the profitability. No, the problem is you have what are called high demanding customers and low demanding customers. So. An example of a high demanding customer, always changing delivery schedule, always buying special, not standard, always calling help desk, always returning goods. You know, the low demanding ones, we love them. They only never only buy standard, never shift schedule. So when you bring in and trace those true costs, you may discover that your largest customer in sales is unprofitable because they're causing you so much extra work. So this is needed to help sales and marketing focus on which types of customers do we want to basically pursue and which types not. Exactly. I think that's a very good point because we don't want to get into like the different customer bases. But when we think about this overall, because we're going to dive in specifically into cost management, we want to deal with the numbers. When we think about how everything fits in, because there's always a number attached to whatever service or what improvement actually needs to be um, dealt with. How do we kind of like just focus and say, how do we really manage cost, Carrie? Because I know that we, we're almost out of time. Time is running so fast. I want to to zone into cost management now. So what exactly is cost management specifically? And how do we look at that in, in terms of driving performance for organizations? What I just described about activity-based costing, think of that as the strategic use of management accounting. What you're asking is the operational use. So just to re repeat, the profitability, profit margins, more accurate is strategic for making pricing decisions and the like. Now yes. for the operational, because a lot of people in operations, quite frankly, they don't, they don't care where we make or lose money, but they do care about cycle time reduction, removing waste, quality, that now we move into an area that's per, that's often referred to as lean management or six sigma quality management yeah. and the way that the activity based costing contributes to that full of what you're asking is once you have these activity costs in the strategic model it's typically 50 to 70 activities not a hundred or a thousand yeah. you can now string those activities like pearls in a necklace and these are called value stream maps and then the operation the think of it as process flow charts now the operational people with these process flow charts and they now have the amount of money is in each of these activities now yes. They start using techniques like value added or non value added. They start scoring or grading each activity because to the, if an activity is has low value add, they'll say, well, why are we doing it? Or how can we reduce it? It helps them focus. And so that then reduces the cost. So it's kind of like, you know, two singers, harmony singers, the strategic people are understanding the pricing and which much types of customers to target and product profitability. The operational people are saying, hey, we're going to help you lower the costs so that our shareholders and owners make more money. I like that because when I think about cost management as well, you know, it's that critical aspect of business strategy that involves all the planning, the controlling, resources, expenses, everything that comes together, right? That emphasis to ensure that the overall performance is actually there. The strategic objectives are actually met. And a lot of times we think about like cost reductions and efficiencies, right? We think about resource allocations. And I think it ties on to ensuring that we get that competitive advantage. But when we think about that, because I want to dive in a little bit now into project management, and we think about project managers who are here, they're wondering, okay, how does it really fit in? So when you think about your project that may have been bettered out of a key strategy, could have been a case of we want to reduce costs. And how are we going to do that? We want to be more efficient. We get a PM in to say, come in and look at, you know, our values chain. Look at a, where exactly can we become more efficient? What can we put in place? We need to put in new systems. We need to 
to eliminate waste, whatever it actually looks like. So how do we really connect now project management and think about the overall cost management piece as well to connect it for our audience today, Gary? Well, let me, when I hear the term project management, the first thing that comes to my mind as a prerequisite is leadership, the executive leadership. You know, I always say, you know, leaders without followers are just taking a walk in the park. Okay. And people love that have, as well, Gary. <laughs> I have a concern about leaders. This is my impression. I believe in the past, the best leaders and the best executives had the best answers. Today, I do not think that's the case. Today, I think the best leaders and best executives have the best questions. There's too much complexity. There's too much uncertainty. There's too much volatility for those executives to make decisions based on their intuition or gut feel or so-called sixth sense or the types of answers they had earlier in their career that got them promoted to these high levels. They need to create a culture for investigation and discovery and tolerance for making mistakes as long as you know you learn from mistakes. And what this does is now this leads into where analytics comes into play, data mm. science. And remember, I've mentioned I've spent 16 years with uh, SAS, this leader in analytics, and my undergraduate is operations research. So I'm kind of a analytical guy I, here. You're like a superhero. I know we need to bring you back. There's so much we need to unpack, but I'm enjoying this. And the comments are coming in, Gary. They are loving this as well. So, yeah. but but let me talk about analytics now. When you go to you, the lower level, there's business intelligence, and that's been around for 10 years, and that's what I'll call drill down software. Examples would be Tableau, which I think was acquired by SAP, um, uh, Click, uh, SaaS software. It drills down, and so you can see things. But what business analytics does is it takes that information and grows it into more information, allows you to ask better questions. And it uses some of the tools in the data science toolbox like regression, correlation, segmentation, causation. And I know some of you listening to me, you took those courses in the university and you just wanted a passing grade and get the heck out of there. <laughs> well, right. sorry, it's here today. <laughs> here again. Exactly. But here's the good news. You don't need to go to your attic or basement and dig out your old college textbook and learn about that. But you do need people and employees with those skills in your organization that can be analytical. If you want to read a book that really put analytics on the map, it's over 10 years old. It was written by Professor Tom Davenport, D-A-V-E-N-P-O-R-T. He's a professor at Babson College in Boston. The title of the book is Competing on Analytics competing on analytics. And that book got it into the C-suite where all of a sudden executives began to realize, hey, we've got to take this analytics uh, a lot more seriously. I, I love that because when we think about analytics and we think about the work that a lot of programmers actually do, they are brought into the space and then it's the case of this is an initiative. You know, they have to think about how they're going to turn that idea to something tangible. And the numbers and the cost is always something that's always top of mind. On a strategic level, the C-suite executives have already put a numbers to say, it's going to cost us probably $500 million, whatever that is. But now, like, when you drill down a little bit, what exactly in managing cost overall from what you've seen and from experience, what tricks are up your sleeves that PMs can actually leverage to better manage costs overall? Well, when you say overall, what comes to my mind is the future. This is budgeting and planning because it's the future. I like to view management accounting as having a rear view mirror, which is past periods, last month, last quarter, and a windshield, which is next month, next quarter, next year. And mm -hmm. so this is where, if you will, budgeting comes into play, as well as decision support like capital investment justification, buying mm -hmm. a piece of equipment or something. And so when you say cost management, the way I'd like to think of it is cost planning, decision and um, for decisions. Yes, the, 
rear view mirror, I already described lean management, Six Sigma, yeah. you know, cycle time reduction, you know, removing waste, improving quality, all of that stuff, reducing, being more efficient, you know, reducing the costs of the existing processes. But when we go to the predictive view, the windshield, now we do need to get into some of the forecasting methods. And look at that forecasting. Now we're back to the data science because tools like, like correlation and regression, regression analysis is basically a statistical method that looks at various parameters and variables. And then you basically estimate what they'll be in the future. And it leads to what's called capacity management. Notice this is the industrial engineer in yeah. me, you know, I was a financial division controller at age 27. So I've oh. been in the accounting, in the accounting and finance space ever since. But I always tell the accountants, I'm an engineer masquerading as an accountant. You need to think like an engineer. And, yeah. we're capacity, yeah. we're, and then when you get to capacity management, ah, now this gets tricky. You have to classify the behavior of the resources as sunk fixed step fixed or variable so notice yeah. now management managerial accounting starts becoming management economics it really is an economic analysis of which engineers are well skilled at understanding that and frankly most cfos and accountants are not skilled with fixed and variable they you know they just think everything's an expense because that's the way they report to the government regulatory agencies so uh planning budgeting, rolling financial forecasts, what if scenario analysis, capital investment justification, make versus buy decisions, outsourcing. Notice every one of those examples is a predictive through the windshield view. So you need to have skills to, if you will, estimate what will be those costs and expenses in the future. Uh oh, you're mute. You're this muted. Is a segue for project lifestyle. I just love what Gary just spoke about. We just think about cost management. He just spoke about the what if analysis. On a project lifestyle segment, I was thinking about how do we manage costs overall, especially in our personal life. And I want to dive into the what ifs because a lot of the times when we think about cost is about like money expenditure. We think about I think about strategic plan. I think about my life overall. I think. I need to expense for what I really need. And then I put the extras just for backup for the rainy day. But what if, what if things actually change? What if what I really wanted isn't really necessary? Or what if the economics actually changes as well? What can you put in place? It's kind of like risk management, right? You do like that probability versus impact. How do you think about that even in your personal life? It always starts with the numbers, right? I always go back and I think about what are the things that I really needed. As a business, you're going to think about your customers. And for you in your life, you're going to think about your customers being either maybe the family unit, maybe even for you, you could be a customer to yourself. Think about what are the core needs? What do you, where do you need to be in the next 10 years? And how do you plan for that today? It starts with the numbers, but understanding what those things are helps you. So number one for me is the budget. I always think about what is that number? And I put the what if scenario to say the worst case scenario, you know, the best case scenario. How do you put together? How do you make that analysis to come to get to, to actually arrive at whatever the number is? So identify where you need to get to overall, putting together a number for that. And then thinking about the expenses analysis, that where you go review all the different areas and, and look at the, the, the discrepancies and also the redundancies. Where exactly, or where have you bought it for stuff before that you could always push things around? I'll give you an example. For instance, you know, times when you're planning like for the year, in my home, we look at that overall view to say, where do we want to be? Or what do we want to, what should we have achieved by December? And then we, we actually put out the numbers of what the must-haves would be and maybe even the nice-to-haves. And then we put numbers to that. And then when you look at what's coming in, Based on what you want to get out, it means that probably you maybe need to get another job or get another side business, whatever that is. But it's, it's absolutely critical that you understand where you want to get to, think about the numbers and do analysis, and then you have to prioritize. Prioritization is another key piece that you need to sit back and look and say, if I do this, and if I don't, what are the implications? 
So how do I decide on what needs to be my top priority? What do I need to focus on? What are those big rocks? Think about that and think about how you can improve a bit of what you have and maybe how can you compound the money that you have by savings or investments or property, whatever you think about. But what, as soon as you have a clear picture of where you're at and where you want to get to, you can create a plan that will help you achieve that. And then I think that's debt management. We all have, you know, credit cards or, you know, buildings and stuff, whatever that is, consolidate and understand what are the debts that you have and how can you manage that? Because at the end of the day, it doesn't really go away except you want to go file bankruptcy or something. But we're here to kind of help you have the perfect perspective of the overall picture and actually manage the cost, manage your life strategically to create something better. There's so many layers, but think about the numbers, think about how you prioritize, think about how you manage debt. It might actually mean you consolidate what, you know, your expenses. You think about what are those things that, that need to be top of mind and cut away the things that are irrelevant. Things like impulse buying, right? And negotiate. I remember going to the shop to go get a TV and we started to grab a bargain and say, we want to we wanna pay less. You know, try and grab a bargain and think about that. Overall, you create something even bigger and better. Mr. Gary, I know you've been here for such a long time, but you think about the fact that, you know, we've done this for organizations, but when it comes to our personal life now, how can we better manage costs? Well, let me go back all the way to when I was very, very young. And I mentioned I mean, I'm, that I'm Greek American, but my parents had a delicatessen. What else? I came from a working class family. Uh, my brother and I, my family, we lived in a 1,200 square foot apartment above my mom and dad's grocery store. So we didn't have money, never really had much money, never lived in a house my entire life. But what I began doing as soon as I started having jobs is I'll just use this simple rule. I separated my income from my spending. I disconnected them. So, you know, if I got a paycheck of X, I didn't spend X. I just, I only spent on what I needed, not what I would desire. You used impulse buying. And, you know, I started that, you know, my work life in my early 20s. And then every year by separating my income from my spending, guess what's left over? Savings. And the savings would accumulate and accumulate. In the good old days, the interest rates were like five, six, seven percent. So then you had the power of compounding. And so, you know, 10, 20, 30 years later, all of a sudden, gee, I have a really big savings account to invest and so forth. I didn't waste it by impulse purchases or buying stuff that I really didn't need. So, that's sort of a simple rule that I, it was really a, maybe a personal style, you know, don't spend money if you don't really need to, because you're going to accumulate savings and the savings is whether it's a rainy day or pay for college, your kid's college. And my grandsons are 20 and 22. Those are my grandsons. So <laughs> you now know that my daughters are 50 and 52. I've already had the life. Fola, before we get to q and I'd like to make an, a few observations about something. It's a okay. frustration. It's a okay. frustration I have. I want to return back to those enterprise and corporate performance management methods, strategy map, balance, core card, activity-based costing, driver-based rolling financial forecast, so forth. My frustration is what is taking so long for companies and organizations to implement these? Mm -hmm. And there's a few barriers. One of them is uh, dirty data, you know, in their IT system, they don't, they have low quality data, and, but the IT people have a tool called extraction, transform and load, ETL, they can clean the data. Another barrier preventing them from moving ahead is their perception that it's too complicated, like to put it in an activity-based costing system. Oh, every employee would have to out, fill out a timesheet. Oh, it'd have a 2000 activities in it. Oh, we have to extract it. All of those are misperceptions. As I mentioned earlier, and, and people can email me if you want to know, with my rapid prototyping with iteration methods that I do consulting for clients, I implement these methods in, in a week or two, really fast. 
But the real problem, the biggest bear has got nothing to do with technology, nothing to do with software, nothing to do with system. It's people. And it starts with resistance to change. Resistance to change is human nature. People love the status quo. You know, only babies like change, change the diapers, you know. But other, but other barriers, fear of others knowing the truth. Oh, I don't want the other departments to know what my costs are. Fear of being measured, fear of being held accountable. Weak leadership. No, no, we might just drive it a little bit. Fear that the employees have. Don't you also see another layer where we have senior leaders as well who are up there? And it's kind of like um like punishment as well for those people who are more transparent. And so this employees are kind of scared to say, if I show the numbers the way they are, I may even lose my job. So there's also like another layer where we need to also have the executive leadership who need to start demonstrating that open minded to say, let us see where it is. You, you know, we want to learn a learning organization where we need to get the feedback. We want to be able to continuously improve. Rather, it's just been a case of right, if things go wrong, you're out of the door. And so I think there's also, there needs to be like a shift. It has to be a win-win on both sides. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But let me take it further. I know the, the audience listening to me are project managers. And what I've been describing, these enterprise corporate performance management methods need, need to be implemented. Those are projects. And so the project manager may be, I don't know, coaching the manager that's implementing the ABC system, what have you. But here is the key. You need soft skills mm -hmm. because to overcome that resistance to change requires behavioral, if you will, change management. And I always ask my audience, how many of you have degrees in sociology or psychology? None. You're all basically technical. You're what I call Newtonian, or excuse me, yeah, Newtonians, you know, like the physicist Isaac Newton. To most project managers and managers, to them, the world's a big machine. Give me the levers, the pulleys, the dials. You need to be somewhat Darwinian, like Charles Darwin. It's an organism. Sense and, sense and respond. So yeah. don't, don't, my message is don't underestimate the importance of having the soft skills of how do you get buy-in? How do you get overcome resistance? Because people are uncomfortable with change. And to get these progressive methods for the improvements that you've been referring to in, in your previous podcast as well. You know, there's a, I see the theme, Fola, in your, in your podcast. It's all about improvement, improvement, improvement. But you got to get people to contribute to making the improvement. So change management's a big deal. That's a great segue right to questions and answers. We had this question popping even earlier. I said, what are the key challenges businesses face in implementing strategic cost management and how can you overcome them? Because we just said change. So I know a resistance to change. So how can we even overcome the resistance to change? Well, I have a method. Oh, golly. It's based on if people want to write this formula down, it's called D times V times F is greater than R. D as in dog, V as in Victor, times F as in Frank is greater than dog. So because D, V, and F are multiplicative, if either of them are zero or very small, you're not going to overcome the resistance. So you're, everyone's asking, what's D, V, and F? D stands for discomfort with the current state. Unless there is a sense of dissatisfaction or unhappiness, no one's going to bother to want to change. V yeah. V stands for a vision of what better looks like. So if you've got yeah. big D discomfort, you're looking mm -hmm. for the lifeline or the lifeboat, which are these various solutions, these various EPM yeah. methods. But F is the sleeper. F stands for first practical steps. Because if they think your solution is overly complicated, overly theoretical, unaffordable, then they're not going to move ahead. So Put, what's the context? F is the rapid prototyping, pilot project, proof of concept, you know, that I, I do these rapid prototype, build them really fast, just for a day or two, and then a few iterations to refine it, get it better. Because that takes away the, the cynicism that it's too big, it's too complicated. Really, oh, this is actually pretty easy. But to answer your question, let me just get back. To me, the key to overcoming resistance is the D and D stands for, and where I do that is pain questions. Now it can mm -hmm. be career limiting to go to your CEO or executive team and ask these types of questions. 
Yeah. Does everybody understand your strategy? Do we know which we make or lose money? Do we know which customers are more or less profitable? Are we measuring the right things? Notice, I just asked those four questions. If I ask those yeah. questions of the CEO, the executives, how are they going to feel? Well, the, e the ones with the big egos, they're going to say, push back and say, quit asking me these questions. You're just a lower level yeah. person. But the yeah. ones that are going to be more in tune are going to say, golly, you're really right. We don't know where we make or lose money. We don't, yeah. are, we're not measuring. So what you did is you created the discomfort. And by creating that D, the discomfort, you open the door for them to say, how would I address this? And then you come in, here's the various improvement methods. And we can now put a light in a dark room that was dark. All of a sudden with these methods, you get visibility and transparency. You see yeah. your profit margins, you see your strategy. So um, pain questions. And if people want to send me an email, I actually have a document with 16 pain questions that you can ask, but it's career limiting. You don't want to get in trouble <laughs> with your executive. We don't, we don't want anyone to limit your careers, but there are different ways you can actually get there. To Gary's point, like we want to ask the right questions, but you want to do that. One way that I have done this one in my career is ensure that you don't ask those questions like in a boardroom where you're going to see on other people or clients. Then you're already going to make your boss or the people around you feel like they're, they're pretty much doing things that are wrong. You know, strategically, you could have coffee with your boss and ask us questions. You could do meetings, take things offline. That way you can tackle a lot of it. So we're going to probably have that guy. We're probably going to have it in the show notes. That's attach this pain point. So make sure you send your email and register. The link's going to be in the comments so you can get this pain point and all the free tools as well. The goal one main question that we're going to be asking is about how can we influence leadership to invest in technology to actually benefit from it? Question about influence. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and off the top of my head, I got to think here how I would answer that. Um, education and awareness is so fundamental. I mean, all of you who are attending, you know, this podcast with FOLA, what are you doing? You're being educated and hopefully inspired. I like to say I just don't want to educate, inspire. Oftentimes when I do seminars in rooms, I go to the door when people exit and they say, very interesting. And I say, interesting or relevant, you know, <laughs> is it relevant? So um, a lot of executives don't take the time to learn. You know, they think I'm going to exaggerate. They may be, I'm a know-it-all. I already know all the answers. That's why I'm the executive. That's how I got here. No, you got to go through continuous learning. And so the question was, how do you influence them to understand yeah. technology? Technology, you know, whether it's equipment or robots or machines, you got to educate them. You know, I, this will be a long message, but I just want to bring it up. There is a revolution in place with artificial intelligence, robotic process automation, machine learning, cognitive software. Uh, everybody's heard about chat GPT. That's the hot topic with AI. But here's the point. These methods, these technologies are going to relate, replace humans, replace jobs of employees. In fact, I encourage people to go to YouTube, click, go to YouTube and click in a 20 minute video called humans need not apply. I'll repeat that humans need not reply. It will scare you how many jobs, driverless cars, this truck drivers will be replaced with a, with a driverless truck, accounts payable clerks, different clerks, their jobs are gonna be replaced by computers. So we've got some real barrier, we've got some real threats ahead in our future. No, no, for sure. Without a doubt, there's so much. I love the fact that you just said it. Has this been relevant? Has it just been interesting? Let me get a heart in the comments as well if you've been listening. And I want you to actually write there. Has this been relevant for you today? We've got so much to unpack, but I want to just say thank you so much, Gary. We need to bring you back. We were not able to get through the eight, but watch out. I'm going to be bringing Gary back where we're going to have a full panel. We're going to dive into this. But let me know in the comments. Has this been relevant? Is it just been interesting? But what exactly can we also do to improve on this? I want to see that. Is it also scary? I just saw someone said it's scary. That's great. It's all about continuous improvement. 
Gary, I want to say thank you so much for being here. Gary has already shared that as well. You can connect with Gary on LinkedIn. His email has also already been put in by my team on how you can connect with him via his email as well. Gary, you just downloaded seven decades of experience. <laughs> We want to say thank you. And it just feels as though you just probably turned 30. I cannot wait to keep learning from you. I want to say thank you to all those who actually joined. If you've actually not put a comment, I want to see that. Um, Tayaba, I can actually see. Oh, Jay's backstage. Thank you for being here. Rama Wasara. Oh, goodness, all the way from India. We've got Pakistan. We've got we even at China last week. I want to say thank you so much. Saudi Arabia in the house. Nigeria. Yes, thank you so much from Charlottetown, from England. We had um, Chicago, Ethiopia, Riyadh, Nairobi. Oh, goodness. I want to say thank you so much for all of you for being here. But with everything, this will be worth nothing if you don't take action. Just, just one oh, comment. Be because yes. so many of your audience are from international. I just want them to know when I was with SAS, they had me do a lot of international travel. So India, Chennai, Hyderabad, Mumbai. I've been to South America, been to Africa, Ghana, uh, Europe, of course, all of those countries. So I loved visiting the world. And one of the things I've learned is people are far more similar than they are dissimilar. You can speak different languages and have different colors, but in the end, people are the same. And the other thing is being Greek American, you know, food for the Greeks is a celebration. So I love eating the different cuisines and foods in all of those countries that I visited. <laughs> My goodness, thank you so much. All the way from North Carolina. It was so great to have you today. And just to let you guys know, I am logging in from Lagos, Nigeria today. It's been oh, fun. It's been wow. great. It's been a roller coaster, but it's been so much fun to be here today. I want to say thank you to each and every one of you. But as I said, you are your life's project manager. Make your life's project count for something. And how can you ever count? By taking action. We can think about this. I heard a wonderful quote. So you can read about swimming for the next 10 years, but until you get your, yourself in the water and get wet, you can never <laughs> learn it. To get yourself wet today, let us make a positive thing in the universe. I want to say thank you. Same time next week, we're going to try to bring you some great juicy content. But let me know, was this relevant? Was it just interesting? What can we do to improve on this? And what action are you going to be taking away to make this even better? Thank you so, so much for listening. I want to thank my host for doing all this as well. Say thank you in the comment. They, they set all these pieces off for me to make sure that I could bring this live to you all over the world. So, Thank you, everyone, for being here. See you same time next week. Have a good day.